welcome to the Offspring Magazine podcast. I'm Yuli and I will be hosting this episode. This is part two of my series on black holes. For this episode, I visited the MPI for Gravitational Physics in Hannover, the sister institute to where Laura Sperner works, my guest from last week's episode. In fact, if you haven't listened to last week's episode yet, I would recommend you to do so. It covers the basics of black holes, space, time and relativity, and it will help you better understand the contents of this episode. With Laura, I already started to talk about gravitational waves. This week, I talked to Frank Omel. He is a member of LIGO, the experiment that in 2015 measured gravitational waves for the first time. We talk about gravitational wave detectors, the information about black holes that is contained in gravitational wave signals. And Frank also explains what new aspects we have learned about black holes since the first detection of gravitational waves and what's in store for the future in terms of improving the sensitivity of current detectors and building new ones. And we even listen to some gravitational wave signals. So stick around and enjoy this episode. Welcome to this episode of The Offspring Magazine, the podcast. Um, I'm here at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Hanover with Frank Rommel. Hello. Welcome Hi. for joining. <laughs> Thank you for joining this podcast. Uh, could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm Frank. Um, we're here in Hanover, Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics, where I lead an independent research group. That's a small independent group. I've had this now for six years. And it's fixed term, so eventually I'll have to move on, um, hopefully to a permanent position somewhere. Yeah, I work in gravitational physics. I've done so since, well, really my master's diploma at the time. Um, uh, that I was in Vienna. I moved to our assistant student in Potsdam to my PhD in the Max Planck Society. Then I moved to Cardiff in the UK. Um, this is where I was heavily involved in the LIGO scientific collaboration. I'm still, I still am, but um, I remember the time in Cardiff because that was the time of the first gravitational wave detection, very exciting time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure that also helped uh, coming back now here to lead my own group. Fascinating. Um, okay, so yeah, we're here to talk about gravitational waves and how we detect them and what we can learn from them. So I think it would be nice to start with an introduction to gravitational waves. What are they? Um, yeah, great question. Uh, I think it's first important to understand what gravity is. Uh, of course, we have to go away from this Newtonian picture of there's a magic force between everything that has mass. Um, I mean, so Einstein explained to us that gravity, you know, really is the effect of space and time that are curved around us, and every everything, everyone is moving through this curved space time, and. If we are happy to accept that space and time can be curved, then of course it can also have you know can dynamic oscillations, and that's what gravitational waves are. It's oscillating space and time, and those waves propagate through the universe at the speed of light. Yeah, I mean I, I like to say it's very similar to a stone that you throw in the water. There's some disturbance, and then those waves propagate out. Uh, gravitational waves are similar, except that it's not a medium, it's not water or something that is oscillating, but space and time itself, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And also difficult to grasp or imagine for someone who's not used to it, I guess, but... Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of weird because in some sense we are very used to curve space because the space around us is curved, that's why we don't float around, <laughs> but we don't understand it as such. Uh, that's why I agree it's very difficult to <laughs> yeah, imagine um, even a four-dimensional oscillating space-time, even for me. Yeah, it's just the, in the end, a mathematical tool that you work with and... Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's one of those examples where you start with a very complicated uh, equation or a set of equations, the Einstein equations, and if you make enough valid approximations, you end up with something that you've learned early on in your studies, which is the way of equations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... Okay, so these gravitational waves, are they just always everywhere in the entire universe, just there? How do Ash, how, how are they produced? And like... Yeah, in, in, in principle you're right, they're everywhere around us. They're tiny, 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 uh, so we, will, we don't feel them 
and I think we'll never feel them as humans. Um, any uh, time varying mass quadrupole, okay, basically mass or energy that is moving in a way that its quadrupole changes that creates gravitational waves. So in principle, people have said this before, in principle, if I wave my arm when I speak, this creates gravitational waves, but they are so tiny that, uh, I mean, maybe they don't because, you know, everything is quantized, it's even for this level, it's too small. So it's really the most massive objects in the universe that produce gravitational waves that we hope, well, now we can measure them. Mm -hmm. So, for example, black holes. Black holes, fantastic example. Mm -hmm. Because we need something that is ideally very massive and ideally very, very fast um, and in, a, in an accelerated way. I mean, uniform mo movement is, is boring in that sense. And uh, black holes are great because they have a lot of mass, but they're very small. I mean, in fact, everything is sort of concentrated in one point. And that allows them to move, let's say, around each other in binary systems super, super fast, despite the fact that they're so massive. And that makes them a fantastic source of gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. They're so powerful. Okay. But, yeah, they curve space and time enough that we can see those waves, even if we were, you know, um, megaparsecs, gigaparsecs away from mm -hmm. the source. Yeah, so let's get into this, how we see them, because you mentioned they are so, so tiny, so um, it's not an easy task, I guess, to detect them. No, that's right. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it's taken a long time, you know, to detect them. So we want to measure space-time oscillations, that's, that's our goal, and in fact there are various ways and various concepts of how to do this. Um, I think some of the early attempts had, you know, a big metal bar, they were called resonant bar detector, and the hope was that, you know, if space and time oscillates at the right frequency, then you would see those oscillations, they would sort of be amplified in this big um, piece of metal, that didn't work out so well. Now, what we do is we use lasers, laser interferometers, big laser interferometers, where um, you know, there's a laser beam, it gets split, and um, then it's two beams that are coherent, and they go along two different paths at about 90 degrees angle, and then you know they go for kilometers, our biggest instruments, four kilometer arms, three kilometer arms. At the end, they're reflected back, and they do this a couple of thousand times maybe, and eventually, you know, they recombine, they meet again, those two laser beams. And um, if the arms, well, they, they re recombine in this interference, um, and if the way we have set up these instruments now, they almost almost entirely destructively interfere. So actually, there's a little photodiode that doesn't measure up very much, so much light coming out. Um, but if now space is oscillating, that means... You know, ideally one arm gets stretched a little and the other one gets squeezed, also gravitational wave, the, the nature of them helps us because they have this um, 90 degree property of one side gets stretched, 90 degree two gets squeezed. Okay, so the one arm gets a little bit longer, the other a bit shorter. That means the two laser beams that meet again, they don't destructively interfere so much. So suddenly there's more light coming out um, and that's what we can measure. Simplified picture, but yeah, yeah. in the end it does work. Yeah. <laughs> Let's maybe talk a little bit more about this light interference, just for people who might not be yeah, familiar with the concept of yeah, light interfering destructively or not destructively. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the, the concept is that basically these, these photons going back and forth, or light going back and forth is in the forms of waves, and then you set them up in a way that the, the mountain of the one wave from coming from the one arm is coherent with the like the value of the wave from the other arm, and that's how you like get no light in the end, right? Exactly, yeah. and and um, it's nice that you say this because, as I said, it was a very simplified picture. I mean, we really need need a very stable, coherent light source. You mm -hmm. know? I mean, there, there are people here in Hanover and around the world that do research on, on lasers that are appropriate for this. Yeah, so that we have. Um, a, a light beam with a very well-defined frequency and a clear phase, and it's exactly as you say, so we can, you know, visualize them as, as waves, and, you know, the, the peak of, of this oscillation meets the negative peak, and then the sum of the two is basically zero. Um, 
But in order for this to work properly, you cannot have light sort of scatter of dust. You cannot have it go arbitrary ways because all of this would make this interference pattern less clean. Um, so we have to be super careful that we control um, the way of the, of the light beam to you know, highest uh, precision that we can do. So in fact, it goes through vacuum. So there's no sort of dust particles, hopefully, um, where it scatters off. Um, we have to control the mirrors on all sides that they don't, you know, shake around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like all that. Yeah, so this is really, I imagine, because, yeah, this effect is so tiny and this, what you measure is a really, really tiny squeezing and, and elongating of these arms, but on a scale of, you said, kilometers. So... Yeah, that, that's right. That, so it's it's a... So gravitational waves, they introduce space-time oscillations in general, a relative um, length change. And we're talking about something of the order of 10 to the minus 21 or so that we can measure. I tried to work this out. I mean, I think it comes down to, um, you know, the distance between us and the nearest star is, is a gravitational wave is changed by less than the width of a hair. So it's really ridiculously small, <laughs> um, and and it only it only works because we have these super stable lasers and we we control the noise so much. And in addition, of course, still everything that we, I mean, especially for room temperature, everything sort of oscillates at more than what we want to measure. So there's a lot of, of course, statistical analysis and averaging and coherence, and you know you really need to measure things for quite some while to see these tiny offsets in. Um, yeah, the recombination of those two laser beams. Okay, so you spend quite a lot of time just to measure all of the kind of noises and yeah, things that make this background and then... Exactly, and, to, and yeah, I mean, first it was a decade-long process to even build detectors that um, are sensitive enough. Like, yeah, I said many times now, it starts with the laser, with the vacuum, with those tubes, with the mirrors and the surface they have. The coating has to be special and, and can't have artifacts on it um the, the all of the the optics and how, how they are designed so there's and and then it goes to quantum effects because at the level we're measuring we also have to treat the light as as a, as a quantum thing and just by the statistical fluctuations of you know the photons hitting the, the um for the diet, that's a statistic process. Sometimes they're a bit more, sometimes they're less. Mm -hmm. Even that limits us. Um, so, so people had to design it in a way that it works. And now that we have an instrument that works in principle at this um, sensitivity, there's still a lot of work that goes into, do we understand where the noise is coming from? Why is there suddenly a loud signal? Was it maybe a delivery truck that pulled up or an aeroplane flying over? This huge amounts of work that go into understanding the noise, understanding the detectors and trying to mitigate it. Yeah, yeah, because I was going to ask, you can control, of course, your detector as much as possible, but then with dealing these small effects, the external... Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's exactly, that. no, that's the reality um, of, of the people who work on site and at the data analysts that we have to deal with lots of uh, non-stationary noise sources, call them glitches, um, some of them we understand, some of them we don't understand. The best thing we then can do is characterize how often that happens. And yeah, as I said, it's, it's really everything. It's ground motion um, um, from earthquakes, obviously, but all other ground motion as well that is introduced from uh, the ocean and from you know trains and trucks and people, airplanes, um, air pressure. We have thousands of auxiliary um, devices, monitors that monitor all of these things. Um, when if, you know, I mean, I think there were cases where a phone rings that disturbs the uh, instruments. Um, yeah, it's a lot of it's, it's exciting, fascinating, but tedious work to hunt down all of these uh, noise sources. But that's what we have to do, because in the end, to be confident that we've seen something that doesn't come um, from us, you know, or, or from, from I don't know, the electronics, but really from outer space, um, you know, we have to do those um, tedious tasks to convince ourselves that it's real what we've measured. Mm -hmm. So you're then, I mean, 
you have to really understand also how how exactly your signal that you're looking for is going to look like and then understand which kind of these effects could mimic a similar signal i guess well it's great that you asked that thing here <laughs> because that's that's what i myself and our research group is working um, on it's true that the most sensitive searches um, they rely on a fantastic understanding of the instrument but also a fantastic understanding of the source that we are looking for um, I like to say it's like this effect, if I go into a noisy party, lots of people are speaking, I don't hear anyone, except when someone says my name, mm -hmm. because somehow my brain, you know, has been, I guess when I was a child, been trained, I better listen if someone, you know, says my name. And um, those filter processes, we use them too, that we can compare what we see in the instrument, which is lots of noisy data, with templates or artificial signals that we have created through big numerical computer simulations, complicated analytical calculations, and so on. And do this process called matched filtering, where we constantly compare the sources that we are looking for, or signals of, you know, sources we're looking for, with the data. And if there's a, a great overlap, a great agreement, we check, well, could this have happened randomly? So then we we give ourselves hundreds, hundred thousands of years of data that we artificially generate and see how often does this happen and accidentally just because there's noise. And then when it's okay, it happens once in a year, or once in 10 years, we're like, nah, you know, we don't know. But if we can convince ourselves that one in a million years or in 10 million years, this should not happen just based on noise, then you know, we build up confidence that. Um, uh, that is a real signal. But I, I find this fascinating that we work a bit different to particle physics, for instance, where my understanding is because they repeat the same thing over and over, it sort of slowly builds up over the noise. And sometimes we have the opposite. We have one signal, yeah. and then we look at lots and lots and lots and lots of noise, and the longer we don't see it again, the more confident we get that the one thing we've seen is a yeah. real signal. Yeah, true, that's a bit of the opposite. Yeah, you're right. But, um, I mean, there's so many aspects to it. It only works because we have multiple instruments. I think doing this with only one instrument is not impossible, but it's difficult. Mm -hmm. If we have two instruments and they see the same and they're separated by thousands of kilometers, um, that helps a lot to build, um, uh, to build confidence. Yeah, and we have these complex templates. And it's amazing that, you know, solving the Einstein equation on supercomputers and so on, that the templates that we will agree so fantastically with what we see. So that gives us a lot of confidence and helps us interpret what we're seeing. Yeah, it's nice because it's also like a two-way street. Like you you take the theory and you actually, when you, it's confirmed by the signal that you see, so then you're, you're also confident that the theory was right. That's right. It's like a, it's like a circle. Yeah, 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 exactly. So nature sends us something, but because we have a theoretical understanding of what we're expecting, we can then interpret um, the signal that, that we've uh, heard, seen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, this theory, um, yeah, it's been around for more than 100 years now, so, right, Einstein? Uh, absolutely, yeah, general relativity, um, not so long ago, celebrated its 100th birthday, and, um, yeah, I think it's absolutely amazing that this still holds. Um, obviously, doing astrophysics and astronomy and detecting black holes, this is great. We also test general relativity, our understanding of general relativity, and see if the signals agree with the data, or maybe if we modify the black holes or we modify the theory, if something would fit the data better. But at the moment, it seems like uh, GR is winning, general relativity is winning um, against all <laughs> competitors. Wow, yeah, Einstein, the super genius. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> no, it's cool to see. It's, I mean, I, I love this, that, yeah, someone came up with this theory and then, yeah, decades or centuries later. It still holds up, and yeah, now we're finally able to actually detect the signals. So it's a pretty. Yeah. I agree, and, and it's amazing how many people have contributed on the way. Because of course, I mean, we celebrate Einstein rightly so for this fantastic theory, but if I can believe the anecdotes that are being told, he didn't actually he wasn't convinced that gravitational waves or something real or ever detected. Yeah. So it needed many other people along the way. With the coach to say, well, actually, maybe we can build something, we can detect it. And then so, so many people who actually, you know, put, you know, build the instruments, check the instruments, do the data analysis, do the modeling, do all of this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That I find fascinating. 
Yeah. Yeah, because now, I mean, the LIGO collaboration that you're a member of, how many members are there? I mean, it's now LIGO and Virgo, the instrument in Italy, and Cagra, and together we are more than a thousand people that, that work together. Yeah. Which is a challenge, but it's also a great reward. Yeah. So, and, and again, I insist that a single group, a single person, a single country couldn't do this. It's, it's a worldwide effort. Yeah. It's fascinating. That really is one of the beauties, I think, of, of these kind of like, yeah, all of these kind of experiments that look for these very difficult tasks, like in order to build the instruments and to get to this point, you have to work together, like in among many different countries and continents and cultures. And it's a yeah. beautiful thing, I think. No, I agree. And fundamental science is, is great. It has this idealistic approach. Sometimes in public talks, people ask me, so, I mean, what is it good for? You mm -hmm. know? And I find it very easy now to say, well, it, it doesn't affect our daily life very much, you know, measuring gravitational waves and knowing that there are so and so many black holes out there. But that's not the point. It's sort of curiosity of, of humankind and knowing our universe and history and so on. That That's what drives us. And yeah. Uh, this is such an idealistic approach that the entire world shares. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> um, okay, so you mentioned there's LIGO and then also Virgo and CAGRA. So in total right now there's four gravitational wave detectors. Is that correct? Well, of course, I have, to, I have to correct you in that well, was my own mistake. In that, of course, there's also GEO in the end. So <laughs> not far away from where we're sitting right now, there's a small detector. Um, It's true that officially now that the network of big detectors is the four detectors we mentioned first, two LIGO detectors in the United States, one Virgo detector in Italy. Those are the biggest and most sensitive ones uh, simply because they've started earliest. And and, um, and then GEO, the detector you never has been around uh, for quite some time as well, but it's uh, smaller at 600 meters arm length instead of you know, three or four kilometers um, has, has done and is doing fantastic service as a technology test bed. A mm -hmm. lot of the technology that has been developed here has been moved to LIGO, for okay. instance. And CAGRA is a Japanese detector, the latest uh, member on the block. Um, that's a great innovative design in that it's underground in the mine, and eventually uh, they want to operate this at cryogenic temperatures. Um, so by design, it's a, it's a big and sensitive instrument that should and will contribute uh, in the future. At the moment, it's just at a point where they are starting to measure data. Sensitivity is not good enough that we would expect um, to make astrophysical observations in the very near future, but hopefully this will change soon. Okay. Um, so then maybe let's talk a little bit about the signal and what it looks like and also why it is so important to have multiple detectors. Okay, so... Again, great question. There are many signals that, in principle, we're, we're looking for. Um, as I said, mass that is sort of moving creates uh, gravitational waves, and there are sources like supernova explosions or pulsars, rotating neutron stars, that we think should um, emit gravitational waves at some degree, but probably very small. And we haven't seen them yet, but people look for them. Um, Of course, what I focus on is the signals that uh, we've already detected, which is compact binaries, one, one black hole and one neutron star, or two neutron stars, or two black holes. And they, um, you know, they orbit around each other, they cycle around each other. And the signal they emit at this point is actually pretty boring. It's twice the frequency of their movement around each other. Um, but because they emit gravitational waves, they emit energy, they come closer and closer to one another. And if we have Kepler's law or something, if they orbit closer to one another, the frequency goes up. And this process continues, frequency ramps up until they eventually merge. Newton stars, this is very exciting because they're sort of physically touched and there's material everywhere. Black holes, they just sort of combine and form one black hole. And... Um, we can actually listen to those to those um, signals because the frequencies they emit are in the sort of hundreds to sort of kilohertz regime. Um, I think our ear is better at kilohertz. The actual sources that we see are more towards 100 hertz, uh, but nevertheless, and and you know, I can sing it. it does, <laughs> um, but I also have lots of um, 
audio files and templates that, mm -hmm. that we can play. Yeah. Um, maybe before we do that, quickly we should mention or explain what a neutron star is, I think, because we have talked about black holes and people might know more about them, but neutron stars we haven't really touched yet. So. Very good. Okay. So <laughs> in, in, um, I like to talk about compact objects. Mm -hmm. So th these are all objects that uh, have a lot of mass in a very small, small space. Obviously, black holes are the winner. Um, but the most compact type of star that we know is a neutron star. So, so that's a star um, that you know, the, the matter is so compressed that it's basically just neutrons. Um, and it's, it's just a little bit bigger than a black hole at the same mass, actually. So the, the neutron stars we think are you know, roughly 1.3, 1.4 solar masses, maybe up to two solar masses or so. And um, their size is of the order of, I don't know, 13, 14 kilometers, yeah. um, which is quite remarkable. So you need something that is bigger than our sun and shrink it together to something that is the size of a city. Um, it's basically just before collapsing, but it's not collapsing. You know, the, the, so this uh, state is, is, is stable. Um, and um, we think for many sort of ordinary stars as they sort of burn and then eventually you know, they run out of fuel and then they collapse. This end product of this collapse, um, depending on how massive they are, it's either can be a black hole or a neutron star or what white dwarf, I think. Um, but yeah, neutron stars and black holes are the most fascinating because they're most compact and can create the loudest signals. Right. Okay, so then, yeah, I would like to listen to maybe one signal. All right. Um, I guess I'm going to move over to my laptop. Okay, I start with fairly standard signal. So as I said, you can hear this frequency that is ramping up and it's just because you know they go around each other at this frequency and as they emit energy, um, they come closer, the frequency goes up, and then, but then the process has to stop eventually as they, as they merge, and this is whoop at the end. And after that, in principle, the black hole rings down, so the, there's one black hole that is generated, and that's a bit perturbed, and it's like hitting, hitting my cow or so. No, it's fine. No. Um, and so black holes have a characteristic ringing that at the end they do to relax and then become just a boring single black hole mm -hmm. that's standing there. Um, yeah, I mean, let me see. Since since I'm here, um, th there's of course cool things that we can hear um, in the signal. It's the frequency, of course, that tells us about how much mass is there in uh, the amplitude, how far away are they, a little bit also about the inclination. But then there are interesting effects, um, like the one we hear now. Which um, we could hear this modulations seem to get louder and quieter, louder and quieter. And that tells us that the system of two black holes is sort of tumbling around, um, and that the orbital plane is moving itself, and it's a, it's, um, yeah, it's like a precessing tip. So it's precessing. We call it a precessing binary black hole system. Okay. And because it's precessing, you can think of it as the inclination towards us is constantly changing, mm -hmm. which makes the signal louder, quieter, louder, quieter. Mm -hmm. That's and cool. yeah, we, we we think we've seen one now that does this, uh, but it's not so easy. It's not so clean because normally there's lots of noise <laughs> yeah. uh, on top of it. And, and this is this is of course great because it tells us something about the history of how those two black holes formed and met. Mm -hmm. um, their yeah, their, their own rotation, their spin, de you know, determines whether they're precessing or not. Okay. Okay, so um, let's maybe go back to like the more simpler signal yep. and more more in the details, like what you can actually like learn from it. So you mentioned the amplitude gives you an estimate of how far away they are. That's right, because gravitational waves fall off as one over r. Okay. So yeah, you can. So yeah. we know in intrinsically how loud the signal is when it gets emitted. We know how loud it is when we see it. So from that you can. Okay, which is like one over the distance. Exactly. It goes down. Okay, so that's the amplitude, and then with the frequency, the 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 
total mass, the mass that is in the system, so the two black holes added together, the mass of them, that determines the frequency. And in fact, for us people who model it, GR is fantastic. Because black holes is vacuum space-time, if I have um, modeled, solved the equations to find um, how a binary black hole with a certain mass sounds like, I know it. I know the same binary for all masses. I can scale the total mass up and down because all that happens is that the frequency goes up and down. Mm -hmm. The heaviest systems emit the lowest frequencies and the light systems emit higher frequencies. So the heavy systems sort of slow up if you want. Yeah. yeah frequencies are okay. lower. Okay, yes. So the frequency basically gives you, like, tells you how fast they are rotating around each other. And they are speed, you mentioned they are speeding up. Exactly. When they get closer to each other, and that's why the frequency is going up. So yep. you just whoop. Exactly. Yeah. And and so yeah, so they span the whole frequency range, but the the way this speed up works, like the yeah, the, the evolution of the frequency, that tells us about um what's in the system, what is the mass, what is the mass ratio, mm -hmm. and in principle also a little bit about the spins, but it becomes the effect becomes, you know, progressively smaller, mm -hmm. so it's h much harder to um, distinguish um, certain spin effects, for instance. Okay. Mass, we can determine quite well. In fact, we determine something that's called the chirp mass, which is a combination of the total mass and the mass ratio, but it's the mass in the system. For us. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and that comes just from the frequency evolution. Right. Okay. Um, good. <laughs> There's no, there's a, there's also the location where's the source coming from. That is not so easy. We right. gravitational wave instruments are not instruments like a point or something. Yeah. Um, so they're more like mi microphones in that they're here uh, from all directions, but not the, not there's not the same sensitivity towards all directions. So that obviously makes it a bit more complicated. Um, what helps is we have multiple microphones with multiple instruments across the globe. Um, so if you've ever seen a, a gravitational wave localization, many of them look like a long sort of arc on the sky, yeah. like parts of a circle or something. Yeah. Right? And that comes from the main information about where they're coming from. It's just a time difference. Because it arrived earlier in the south of the US than north of the US, we can determine what, you know, what... Um, locations are plausible mm -hmm. and then there's a bit more like how is the phasing and so on that helps us determine it yeah. even more but uh that's how we determine the, the sky location uh, very different as i said from classic instruments and, yeah. and that's why it's quite often there's a huge area of the sky yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Right. it makes it very hard for other telescopes <laughs> to follow up on this uh, yeah that's right yeah, yeah it's an interesting <laughs> challenge <laughs> um so uh, this time difference, they travel at the speed of light, right? Correct. Gravitational waves. So this, the time difference between the different detectors is small. Oh, yes, 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 absolutely. I, I think it's something like the maximum is roughly 10 milliseconds, I think, between the two LIGO sites, which is great. Any excess signal that is separated by more than this light travel time should not be an astrophysical signal. Ah, unless, you know, yeah. unless our understanding of yeah. GRs wrong. So that helps us to exclude lots and lots of things because right, yeah, has to be exactly speed of light. Exactly, mm, and then I mean, you can imagine if, let's say, there's a signal that um, that arrives this, let's say, these ten milliseconds earlier in one detector, and then takes the whole light travel time to arrive at the other one. Then we know it has to come from the along the same line that is sort of connecting the two instruments. Right. Whereas if it's arriving at the same time, it's like a standing wave that must come from the top. Mm -hmm. hit both of them. Yeah. All right. So there's a lot of information in there, yeah, too. Yeah. Um, so and do gravitational waves get, like, attenuated somewhere along the way? So would it, could they, like, I don't know, slow down or become less, even less, you know, in amplitude? Uh that's a great question. Um, I think if you ask a theorist, we could now talk forever on how exactly this works. In practice, especially compared to say electromagnetic waves or so, gravitational waves are fantastic in that they don't they don't bother what they go through. Mm -hmm. um, there's no significant damping. Um, they just you know expand through the universe. It doesn't matter whether they're about the stars or the black holes or other you know dust or something okay. on the way. 
Of course, if you look at the nitty gritty details, it does matter a little bit if, you know, stars, I mean, you know, it, it goes through space and time and stuff is in space, space and time. So that starts moving, but that itself creates new gravitational waves, so sort of compensates a little bit. Mm -hmm. There are lensing effects, mm -hmm. just like with electromagnetic radiation, but all of them is, all of these effects are very, very small. Okay. So in practice, we can assume it's just the source in us. And it's propagating un, you know, hindered through the universe. Okay. Um, so my next question would be: um, Does it ever happen that we like see two signals at once? Oh, oh yes. We we have not ah, <clears throat> defined signal. What we had is, I said very at the very beginning that uh, the instruments themselves they sometimes glitch. You know, so, so, so we had prominent cases where there was wonderful gravitational wave signal and on top of it was an instrument artifact. So we had to do with, deal with sort of two things at the same time. What we have not seen so far is two astrophysical signals arriving more or less at the same time. Um, but it might happen. And in fact, in the future, if we think about the next decade or so and the next generation of instrument, it will happen for sure. It will happen to an extent that um, we see there's so many binaries out there in the universe and they all emit gravitational waves. Um, and if we only look far enough out into the universe and the instruments are sensitive, there will be some background noise of binaries all sort of going on at the same time that we can't even resolve that anymore. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, it's not a problem, but in the future, we will have so many binaries that some of them we can't even resolve, just some background and others that will sort of be loud and stand out, but they might be so close that they overlap a little. Okay. So it's active research going into it at the moment. How do we do with this? Analyze them together, analyze them separately and subtract one. Yeah, so no trivial problem. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so like what makes the sensitivity by which parameters are you going to improve with the next generation of detectors or in the future? Like how, how ah. do you do that? Great. I mean, this is where I just can stand there and awe and be amazed at what the, you know, our experimental um, and the technicians and, and the, the people who actually build and design the instruments, what they come up with. Um, easiest thing is if I think of uh, what LIGO, where LIGO wants to go, they want to go to Cosmic Explorer, that has gigantic arm length. So going from four kilometers to 40 kilometers mm -hmm. a day. Um, the laser power can help if that gets increased, although there's sort of quantum effects, that, you know. But yeah, so in increased laser power, um, increased better materials, better suspension. I mean, one of the things that keeps the mirrors where the laser beams go between them so still is that they're suspended from the ceiling and, you know, it's kind of moved. So that people can improve. Um, one thing that I find fascinating is... Uh, um, something called squeezed light they've developed this here in Hanover where they say okay there's this quantum limit I can I mean I cannot beat quantum mechanics you know um, um, photons they arrive at the photodiet stochastically because they're quantum objects but you know the Heisenberg uncertainty you can you can maneuver it in a way that you put a lot of uncertainty into something that you don't care so much mm -hmm. and, you know and you win a lot of certainty of accuracy in uh, what you do care about. Let's, so let's quickly explain the Heisenberg principle. <laughs> oh, <what? laughs> Just shortly, because, yeah, I think many people might not know. Yeah, no, I mean, quantum <laughs> mechanics says that, that um, states are observable, are inherently sort of uncertain, stochastic nature, and how accurate you can measure them has a natural limit, and the way this is often formulated is, for instance, with Location and velocity this is the classical mechanical Heisenberg principle, where you say you cannot measure uh, the velocity and the position of a particle arbitrarily well. Mm -hmm. The product of the two uncertainties has a limit, um, um, lower limit to this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but what the Heisenberg uncertainty does allow you to do is to measure one thing very accurately at the expense of the other. I measure if I restrict the location of a particle fantastically accurately, then its velocity is almost unconstrained and vice versa. Um, so, and the same works on the 
photon level, so I, there are properties of the photon uh, amplitudes and phase uncertainty where I can make one very, very accurate at the expense of the other. But of course, if our measurement is mainly based on one type of um, uncertainty, then you know I, I might make this one um, very accurate, and I can live with the fact that some other property is now not measured very well. And that, I mean, it's almost like magic that sort of beats the quantum limit. Um, and yes, they, they, they call this process squeezing light, mm -hmm. um, okay. which yes, mm -hmm. is fascinating. Yeah. But that's as much as I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is one of the sophisticated ways. And there are many others that I, I forgot to mention. Them, but they can bring the um, sensitivity down of the instruments. Low temperatures is another one. Um, mm -hmm. At room temperatures, of course, Brownian motion, everything moves at room temperatures. If we lower the temperature, things don't move as much and we don't have so much thermal noise. So that's another um, improvement people are working towards. Okay. And all of this will improve the sensitivity in terms of distance, so you will be able to detect weaker signals. That's right. So the way it works is that um, those noise sources, they are mainly at certain frequencies, some are for low frequencies, some are for high frequencies. And if the noise level goes down, that means I can see weaker signals, and that in turn means I can see the signals farther out. So mm -hmm. yeah. exactly as you say, um, those more sensitive instruments can look further out into the universe, and that means we will see more sources. But still only mergers of neutron stars and black holes? Or will you also be able to see a different sort no, of... No, hopefully not. We're working hard towards also seeing, listening to whatever, more of the universe. Um, th yeah, again, there are... there are My admittedly also simplified understanding is, for instance, supernova explosions. In some sense, we just have to be lucky. We have yeah. to wait until a supernova goes off, not too far from us. <laughs> um, Rotating neutron stars, that is, these super compact stars, they rotate, we know them as pulsars when they emit uh, radio um, waves. But if they're not perfectly spherical, if they have a little mountain, mm. then they emit also gravitational waves at the, the you know, rotation, twice the rotation frequency. And that we have super sensitive search methods for that. People here, for instance, work on this, but we haven't seen them. Um, and now the question is is it because? The neutron stars in our universe are really super spherical, or maybe like it was with black holes, there are all these signals that are just waiting to be discovered. If we only you know become a bit more sensitive, mm -hmm. so that's a hope. Then there is um, background um, radiation from you know the early universe. Gravitational waves should have been produced there. Um, there's other background um, of many, many, many sources that are just out there that form some sort of background. These type of sources we will eventually uncover as we lower, whilst we increase the sensitivity, lower the noise. Exciting things. Yes. Ahead in the future. Very exciting. <laughs> um, okay, but then maybe let's talk a little bit more about um, basically what happened between the first detection of the first gravitational wave signal, which was in 2000. So you detected it in 2015? 15, correct. The announcement was early 2016. Yes. 100 years after Einstein. That's exactly right, yeah. <laughs> this is a very beautiful symmetry there. Um, but uh, yeah, so what was this first signal and then which signals have you detected since? What happened since? Um, so the first signal was very special in so many ways, uh, obviously okay. being the first and so on, but also it was two black holes that are somewhat massive. Um, okay, so there are many black holes in the universe. Some of them are supermassive, millions, billions of solar masses, like in the center, the center of our galaxy, center of maybe all galaxies. Those we don't hear, see at the moment with the instruments we have because their frequencies are too low. Mm -hmm. So... LIGO was designed to detect um, lighter binaries, in particular neutron star binaries. We know that they're out there. Um, we've seen electromagnetic radiation. But the first signal was not a neutron star binary. It was a binary black hole of stellar mass um, black holes. And it was, I think it was sort of exciting and maybe unexpected that they were in this range of stellar mass system. They were quite heavy. It was not five or ten solar masses, the black holes were 30 solar masses, 27 or something. So somewhat um, heavy black holes, 
the signal is very, very loud. Um, so we were extremely lucky again. Um, yeah, that was that was the first signal. It was good because it was so clean. And um, okay, and the pattern was that we saw more of those type of systems quite frequently. Black holes that are, you know, significantly heavier than solar mass or neutron stars, um, in the range ten to thirty, thirty-five, forty solar masses, and also. Um, the, the pair of two black holes, they were similar in, in, in size and similar in mass. So the mass ratio was always close to unity, which um, I think people had predicted before, but because it's, you know, black holes are hard to find. Uh, <laughs> none of this, I think, was uh, set in stone or super clear. It's the gravity wave measurements that, that helped us to really nail down a bit. So we saw in the first observ observing run in total, two, three and a half. There was one we weren't quite sure, but now we're quite sure there was one um, binary black hole signals. And this continued in the second observing on more binary black holes. And then there was the first neutron star murder in, in 2017, which was again like a revelation in a sense that it was, we did not only hear um, the gravitational wave signal, but also electromagnetic radiation, gamma rays, well, anything really, you know, <laughs> UV and, and radio, and I mean, it was absolutely amazing. Okay, now we've had three observing runs. I should say observing runs, one stretch where we listen to the universe and try not to touch the instrument very much. Um, so three observing runs are over now, preparing for the fourth one. And we've now seen the majority is again, um, black holes, we can talk about the details of why this, what, what is so fascinating about that population. Um, about 90 binaries we've seen, almost 100. Majority of binary black holes. Um, two, we're pretty certain, both objects are neutron stars. Okay, one, we're 100% certain because you know, there's, there's electromagnetic radiation with it. And then there are at least two signals where we think it's a mixed binary, mm -hmm. one black hole and one neutron star. Okay. Um, and like, okay, bef so before LIGO detections and all of this, there were really not that many observations of black holes on like, and what was the, like the super new thing? Or like, what did you learn from these observations about black holes that we didn't know before? Uh, also a great question. Okay, <laughs> it was a bit d difficult in that, Maybe I now say things where other people say, oh, I knew this before, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always this debate. But um, I think it was fair to say that because observations of the um, center of our galaxy, we knew that, you know, supermassive black holes existed. And then, of course, there are, you know, um, I think X-ray observations that also pointed towards stellar-sized black holes, but very few. And the properties of those stellar-sized black holes weren't so clear as a, as a sort of population. Of course, people knew theoretically or they were expecting that in the life of a star, as it burns out, many of them should you know, turn into black holes. But exactly how many, how often, um, how massive, that's a big question there are, that, that wasn't so clear. And I, I, I guess I can speak about myself, so no one can complain about my own naivety. I was surprised, I mean, there are really many, many binary black holes out there. And they, are, they span quite a large uh, mass range. And again, the, the lightest we've seen are sort of five, six solar masses. The heaviest, it's not so clear actually, the heaviest black holes that we've seen in those binary systems, they live in a mass region. They're so heavy, they shouldn't actually exist according to some theories. Um, because, I mean, we think most of them, all of them maybe, are generated by a star collapsing. And this process needs a star to be massive, but not, strangely enough, not too massive. Mm -hmm. If it's too massive, there's something that's called a pair instability supernova that basically evaporates everything and no black hole is left behind. And as I understand it, you know, don't work on this particular theory, um, this is very solid. Um, and the standard expectations were that, you know, 40, 45 solar masses, you shouldn't have black holes heavier than this. But now we've seen binary systems where it's pretty clear that the black holes are heavier than this. Um, 
so, and I find this fascinating. On the one hand, if I look at all of the black holes we've seen, it looks like, you know, there are, there's like an overabundance. Several of them sort of are around the 40, 35 solar mass range, which is consistent with the fact that we shouldn't have heavier systems. If the systems are heavier, either it gets a bit rid of its mass and then it collapses to a 35 solar mass, or they don't exist. Okay, that's fine. But then in this gap, mm -hmm. there are systems. Um, and other questions, where do they come from? Maybe this pair instability theory doesn't quite work. Um, the other interesting idea, of course, is that, well, if I have two black holes and they merge, then there's a bigger black hole. Mm -hmm. So you can populate this gap simply by, this is a second generation. Um, it has black hole parents, <laughs> second generation black hole. And then again, people do the math and say, well, but out there in isolation, it's very unlikely that they merge multiple times. But in environments where there's lots of black holes, lots of happening, have lots of stuff happening in globular clusters or near an active galactic nuclei, so if the density is high enough, then all sorts of cool stuff can happen. Many you know, black holes could merge multiple times. You could have interesting spins and precession and all that. And it seems like we are now getting black holes that fit this picture. Mm -hmm. That they're not just stars that met in isolation and then they were you know there were a couple for ages and then they all burnt out and formed black holes mm -hmm. that's only part of what we see it seems like the other part is very interesting environments where black holes can form dynamically as we call it and have then interesting properties very heavy um spins that you know are not aligned that they process uh, maybe we see eccentric so far they all look very circular which is what we expect but maybe we'll eventually find things that or not, you know, go in almost perfect circles, but eccentric systems. Um, that tells us a lot about the environments where they where they uh, formed. Yeah, and then you, you compare, you know, how many have this property, how many formed in isolation, how many formed dynamic settings, and those are all questions that are completely open right now. And um, I think just by measuring more and more and more and more of those black holes, we'll we'll answer them, which will be very exciting. Yeah, that's that's really pretty cool, and that's really something that you can only do with gravitational wave signals, right? It's not just that's right. no other way to observe these kind of systems. And yeah, but I mean, the black holes are very good at hiding, except when things falls in, and, and but but even that doesn't always shine bright enough that we can see it. So yeah, gravitational waves is a fantastic tool to see so many of them um, so far out. Yeah, and then if you understand these kind of things, like, okay, maybe there were multiple generations of mergers that could indirectly give you some answers to, okay, what was the stellar population at some point? How did it, that whole environment form? Exactly, and and we connect them to people who do, for instance, stellar well population synthesis. They, they sort of model how these things form, and then they tell us you need a certain metallicity in the environment where they formed and so on. I mean, all of this is sort of one step away from gravitational waves, but it is because we see this picture of the universe. They can tell us, okay, the history has to be like this, or you know, more likely is like this. And as we see more and more, we can also um, um, start to probe the evolution. I mean, maybe there's a certain you know time in the history of the universe where more black holes formed, or more, more binaries formed, and then you see them, we, see, we always see the end product of the yeah. black hole merger. Or maybe, you know, the mass distribution changed over the history of the universe, or the redshift, as you call it. Yeah. Um, this, I find this fascinating. We only see the end product of this long, long process, but because we have so much understanding of how it got there, um, just by counting and seeing what we see, we can constrain a lot um, about, yeah, the history of the universe as, as, a, as a whole, which is fantastic. That's really fantastic, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's also nice to see, yeah, the different fields working together in the UK gravitational waves really bringing something new also to other fields that have been around longer, right? So, like, these studies of stellar populations or whatever, I mean, I guess astronomy has been around for such a long time, uh, just optical astronomy, so then... But then you, as the new kid to the blog, basically, you re really bring a new wind into their research, which is... Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice way you put it. I, <laughs> I agree, and, it, and I personally felt the transition was as steep as it could get, because 
prior to the observation of gravitational waves, the gravitational wave business, you know, I'm not sure everyone would have agreed that this is astronomy <laughs> because we haven't seen anything and it was all very sort of theory driven and data analysis heavy. Um, now, of course, exactly as you say, we bring new wind to astronomy and we learn from the astronomers who've done this with optical or whatever telescopes for a long time. Um, and they learn from us. And it's, it's a very exciting um, process. And, you know, the, just to complete the picture, I mean, the neutrino folks that, again, mm -hmm. that something else that's coming coming towards us. And um, astronomy is, is fantastic in that way that we're so limited in what we can do because we can't, you know, we can't have a supernova or a black hole in the lab. We can't travel there. Uh, so we, you know, we have to put a lot of thought behind how can we explain the little things that the universe reveals to us. Yeah. It's very fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we talked about the future already a little bit with the technology that is going into increasing the sensitivity, but there are really concrete plans for the for the next generation of instruments. So maybe you can describe those a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that is say they're cool plans. Um, okay, so the the ground base, the instruments we have now, they will get better and bigger probably uh, and just to mention I mean uh, there's the cosmic explorer project in the United States which aims to build a bigger version of LIGO okay, I'm not giving credit to all of the improvements in there but you know, that's a simple way of saying it in Europe there is the Einstein telescope um, project and collaboration where, where um, we try to build an underground uh, detector that's 10 kilometer long, but probably into triangular shape. So it's like multiple detectors in one location. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's exciting. That will bring lots of technological improvements and therefore, you know, much better astronomy. But then there, there are different designs, um, like the LISA um, instrument, which is laser interferometer space antenna. So this will operate in space uh, with satellites. And so the satellites will, will have the mirrors and lasers in them and, and send lasers to, to one another. And there's three satellites and they form this triangle. And because it's in space, um, I find this fascinating, <laughs> because it's in space, on the one hand, sort of, you cannot, I mean, the technology has to be super solid and stable. You cannot, like in LIGO, go and fix every now and then things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, space is a very quiet place. So certain noise sources we cannot overcome on the ground uh, lisa doesn't you know doesn't have to bother with um, and the arm length is humongous because of space in space um, so that all leads to the fact that lisa will operate at much much lower frequencies below below one hertz millihertz sort of this kind of regime and, and below um, and because uh, low frequencies are sensitive to very massive systems lisa will see you know, galaxies that are merging with their supermassive black holes in there. And they will also see lighter binaries, but much earlier in there, before they merge, much earlier in their evolution. Um, so these are cool projects. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, you know, this has been proved as one of the large missions of, uh, of ESA, the European Space Agency. So we're all excited. This seems to be very concrete and, and going ahead. Um, and then, there is something that people have been working on for a long time and and everyone i think crossed their fingers that they will make solid detection soon which, which is the pulsar timing array so those efforts they don't build detectors as such because um they have ultra stable clocks in the universe which are pulsars so mm -hmm. uh, stars that rotate at their rotation rate is very very stable and we get those pings, um, you know, like a lighthouse, you know, it shines at us every whatever millisecond or so. And we have several of them and, and radio telescopes observe them. And the idea is that if a gravitational wave passes through between us and the pulsar, which can have always gravitational waves, but if it's strong enough, it will change the arrival time of those pulses. So and if I'm if I'm just good enough at measuring, okay, every millisecond I should get a pulse. Oh, this one was a fraction of a millisecond earlier, and the next one was a bit later. And I see this not just from one pulses, but for many pulses. 
Um, the idea is that this positive timing, they can detect gravitational waves through the universe again at very low frequencies. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, this will be exciting. Hopefully, hopefully they, they detect something. And then we suddenly cover you know, a wide range with gravitational waves from very, very massive systems, very, very low frequencies to higher frequencies than what we can do now. Um, yeah, this will just complete our, our picture, um, mm -hmm. hopefully. And I mean, somehow I think it would be, it would not be surprising if we get surprised because we have such a limited understanding of the universe. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic the rate at which our knowledge is growing, but still it's so limited. So in some sense, I eventually I'll hope that one of those instruments or one of those observing ones might reveal something that we haven't even thought of until now. <laughs> yeah, that would be also cool to, yeah, somehow, yeah, have entirely new physics popping up that we had never really thought about. Exactly. Yeah, wow, exciting times ahead. <laughs> also, there's going to be a lot of data to analyze. Oh, yes. Like, <laughs> I imagine. Like in a I mean, this is, I think gravitational wave data alone is sort of manageable. We don't have to assemble it to super high rate. We don't cover the whole, I mean, we cover the whole sky, but just with a time series. But, I mean, multi-messenger astronomy, combining all those uh, astronomical data is such a big topic. And as, exactly you say, there's so much data. Um, the way we as the scientific community will analyze this, this, uh, this is fascinating. And everyone wants to be quick. We want to be quick in sending out our alerts. And, and of course, people look at machine learning or other methods yeah. to, make this, to make this fast. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the computational and the big data aspect is, is certainly very relevant to us as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's also a big, big part of, of all of the research field to try to, yeah, speed up and be more, yeah, find more clever ways to deal with this tremendous amount of data that we are producing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything else you think that is like on your mind that we haven't covered that you really want to talk about? No, I think we've covered we've a lot. Covered a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about the signals, what we learned from them. Yeah. Yeah, this new way of astronomy. Also, I mean, this the fact that we work in this global collaboration. I, I find fascinating aspects of yeah. work, but it's, it's typical for these big projects of astronomy, particle physics, I think people are very used to that. Um, and it's great. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's really one of the great parts, I think, of our research field too. Yeah. And I, I find this is a sort of a life skill that yeah. we, we acquire mm -hmm. that's co completely complementary to solving equations <laughs> um, that I appreciate a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Okay, then I think um, yeah, we can conclude this conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. It was a, it was a great chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and stay tuned for part three and four of the Black Hole series, which will be released in a couple of weeks. If you like our podcast, make sure to follow us on Instagram. Thank you.